Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of Friday Morning at the Fun House, alongside, as always, Mr. Martin Popoff. What's happening, Martin? Yes. Morning, sir. Morning, sir. Well, we're we're in another one of Bill Barron's shirts today. We had a nice meeting with Bill uh, last weekend. Uh, Grace brought over a whole bunch of his friends to the house and brought Bill to the house. So, uh, just wanted to mention him. Of course, he's our he's our buddy who's been felled by a pretty bad stroke, but uh, he'll he'll probably be watching this show at some point. So, just wanted to say, good What's morning, up, Bill. So, hope yeah, hope yeah. you're doing better, my friend. So, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure, every day uh, you just hope for a better day, right? That's how it yeah, kind of yeah. goes. Yeah. yeah, and it was good. it was cold. It was rainy that day, and it's it's cold now. It's uh, it's definitely uh, definitely the fall, a, a nice Canadian fall at this point. Yeah, we got uh, fall here in the Hudson Valley. I think the leaves are just finally starting to say, oh, okay, it's a little chilly now. I think we could turn colors. So it's just starting to happen. We've been having the last couple of uh, mornings waking up to like either the upper 40s or low 50s. And it's it's awesome. The, temp- the temperatures have been great, but we're going to get a lot of rain all weekend from the, uh, the storm that's kind of rolling up the coast. So that's coming tomorrow and Sunday and maybe Monday. We'll see. But uh, very, very pleasant. I mean, I, I love the fall. So for me, this is the best time of year. So... So uh, today's topic, everyone, we have an interesting one. And this uh, this is like a topic that, uh, you know, Martin's brought up to me numerous times over the last bunch of months. And we were talking uh, a week or two ago and we started kind of uh, hashing out this whole idea of music artists creating this mania as they, you know, gain popularity that touches the masses as they kind of take over the world, whether for a short period of time or a long period of time. And initially we were talking about, you know, this whole thing with Taylor Swift going on nowadays. Uh, We had this with Michael Jackson for a number of years, you know, Madonna, Adele. I mean, these artists, you know, more modern popular artists who just caught the attention of the general public and whether it be with, uh, album sales or song downloads or plays on YouTube or these crazy concerts where 50, 80,000 people buy tickets and there's just frenzy about them and their music and their look and all that sort of thing. So we were like, can we kind of make a song, uh, make a song, make a show about this uh, where we talk about some of these artists in rock history who swept up the general public in this whole idea of mania right so so that's what we've done we've each picked out five uh, artists or bands that again either a short period of time or a long period of time swept up the public in this whole frenzy of oh my god these godlike figures whether again album sales tv radio appearances crazy concerts right uh singles mass singles mass sales that whole thing album cover i mean magazine covers and newspaper articles and just everything everywhere you looked that's all you saw were these bands so uh we'll have martin kick us off today with his first choice but maybe you want to expand on this a little bit before you do yeah i guess i'll expand a little so it's a little bit of this idea and these are all going to be a little bit different and uh i've got i i think we both got ones that are like almost like a second mania second wave sort of thing that sort of thing's happening with some of this um so some categories going but the idea of um you know that that falls into a lot of these is uh it's it's not just it's not just uh like they 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 got to be a big band it's more it's more like people were went crazy they lost their mind for a short short uh, length of time uh also the idea of a messiah complex like these guys are going to save rock and roll that sort of thing right it's like and in and like you know critical acclaim everything sort of coalesces around them a little bit of that cliche it's like you know, for this brief time, people maybe even said that guy could be president one day or whatever. Right. Or rule the world or he does rule the world right now or whatever, or she. Right. Um, So, yeah, you know, we, we got to, we were marveling at this whole Taylor Swift thing and how there's just next levels of all this stuff, people outside the stadium and the ticket price is going crazy and all that. And just, and just this big communal psychological experience that's going on at those shows. Right. Um, And then the, you know, people have, to, you know, world leaders have talked about, uh, you know, the the addition to the economy when she rolls through town and stuff like that. Right. <laughs> um, so so a little bit of that. And it's interesting. Last night we did a contrarians episode, which which kind of overlaps a little bit with this on or at least my my first example of this idea of um, it, we, we did a show on uh, what what bands uh, had so much impact on you that they move the needle on your personality or your life philosophy a little bit. Right. So some of these bands, I think, uh, you know, cross into that idea where, where it's like, 
they were looked upon in a super important way. It's not just they, they had a big record or something like that. Right. Yeah, yeah for sure. So that's kind of the idea. Um, so my first one has a theme uh, that does overlap a little with that. And the, the theme is, um, college rock your college years right uh that you know i i remember and and the reason i bring that up is is um i i think i think uh i i've noticed that a lot of these uh you know they, they do line up with university years and it's like it's like there's a mania i guess when you go to university your mind's being opened up and stuff and you're and you're you're the right age for rock and roll i mean you're you're in your advanced sort of years of uh of the early years of of your, the freshness of rock and roll so there are definitely some manias you spot at that time so so i wanted to put in uh one um and then with some subsets that have a little bit of um mania about them so so the ones that for the whole college years experience thing that I would say don't have a mania about them, but but were super important. But you know they they were beloved by critics and all that. I'm gonna build up to the mania. The likes of the Minutemen, um, this whole scene, Minutemen and Firehose at that time, um, and then uh, something like uh, where's that? Yeah, here we go. Husky Do. So next would be something like Husker Do fits into that as well, and there was some mania about this band as well. Um, but, um, importantly, neither of those, see, here's, here's another sort of barometer of this. Neither of those were on the cover of the Rolling Stone, right? So that's, that's a big thing about being a mania, right? I've, I've measured that against a lot of my choices. It's like, you know, you know, you are an it band, you, you know, you're a mania band when you get on the cover of the Rolling Stone. Right. So Dr. Yeah. Hook had that famous song about that. And this is a this is the greatest hits album. And that is the famous song about that. Right. And there's a whole story about them getting on the cover of the Rolling Stone. But so my my college, my college years band. That I think really fits this idea of, of a mania is rem and somehow i managed to hang on to all of these these original rem albums uh you know through through my record store buddy isn't everybody coming by and taking stuff away from me um for some reason i said i'm gonna keep these rem albums and it might be because it, there was a mania uh, about this band uh that i totally bought into and i was just this massive rem fan i won't show them all here but uh um bunch of cds as well getting it getting into the later years but the funny thing is i i did a little bit of a search on um on the ria certification thing and uh, i was surprised to see that this band even when uh, all of us were thinking michael sype was like the second coming of christ is great you know profound wise lyricist and and this you know smith's jangly poppy sound and oh it's so weird and dreamy it must mean something right you know it's that whole thing right um Murmur went gold. Reckoning is gold. Fables of Reconstruction is gold. Life's Rich Pageant is gold. And those are probably more just in retrospect. But right around Life's Rich Pageant into Document, which goes platinum, green goes platinum. It's funny, the mania around REM, uh, you know, the exciting early days mania where they were a big cult band like this was what I'm talking about, those college years of, uh, you know, 84, 85, 86 sort of thing. But uh, it's only with Out of Time, which goes four times platinum. You know, some of these later ones, well, this is this is really later, Adventures in Hi-Fi. But, you know, I, I checked out by this time. Um, you know, it's Out of Time's four times platinum, Automatic for the People, four times platinum, Monster, four times platinum. So, so it's almost like, um, you know, the big years for R.E.M., uh, you know, represents a second mania and it's a different kind of mania as they're as they're also electrifying their sound and being and being a little heavier, like there's a little more distortion on the guitar and it's just a little more rock and rollsy than the early days, which is this kind of folk thing. But uh, yeah, definitely on the cover of the Rolling Stone. I don't know my, how many times, but definitely multiple times. They were a massive band, uh, but they're definitely um, they're definitely one of these bands that you feel was a bit of a was a bit of a cult and you thought you thought they were just super super wise and they were like just this really really interesting uh thing so yeah that's that's my first one kind of a kind of a college category martin were they uh i'm, I'm thinking because i i kind of with all my picks there were mm -hmm. clear um statements on 
overall units sold over their careers. Were they a hundred million units sold worldwide band throughout their career? Do you know? Boy, I would, I would venture to say probably not. Um, I don't know how big this band was overseas, but after monster, it all drops off. They still make more albums. They had, they had an official retirement, I think uh, not, not too long ago. Um, but it drops off. It goes back down to platinum and gold, like a lot of bands eventually do. But I'm surprised to see. I mean, this this is one that uh, it didn't certify as as high as I, I sort of thought they would. You know, I, I definitely put them in that category with uh, with the Smiths, you know, uh, and it's funny. Yeah, the, all these terms, right? You think college rock, uh, indie rock, alternative uh, all these things that come up, but, uh, and obviously this is, this is my college years. I mean, someone else will have a whole different idea of college rock in 1974 or something like that. Right. Um, but definitely a, a mania around REM where, where they were like, you know, the, the wise men at the Mount, the, uh, you know, the, the, the guy on the, the gatefold of Led Zeppelin four standing up there, that's Michael Stipe, right? <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. I remember, when I was in school, so I went to school 84 to 88 in college. And I remember like REM and the Smiths and various other bands were like really popular amongst college kids at the time. But I don't remember, and I was a metalhead at the time through and through, but I don't remember there ever being like a tag or, or a, uh, you know, or a category for that type of music. Like nobody really knew what to call it. Yeah. There was no indie rock at the time. Nobody called anything indie rock at the time. Yeah. Like, you know, is it, what what is this stuff, right? It's just it's popular. Yeah. There was no there was no name for it. It's a really good point. I mean, I I don't know what the truth of this is or or if I'm making this up, but I mean, is there people talk about playing the college circuit? Like are there bands that would just roll through town and just play the college and then leave or like the, the pub close to the college or the pub on, you know, on college grounds. I, I have a feeling that thinking back to those years, there were bands that you knew were a good job uh, draw right on the college campus, but you wonder if they were a draw downtown. So they probably didn't play downtown. Probably not. So yeah. I don't know. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. Might be showing that somehow. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps. Yeah. All right. My first uh, pick today is probably the gold standard when it comes to all that we're talking about and, and the poster child for this. And that's the Beatles, right? Uh, the Beatles were probably the first, uh, you know, you Elvis, right? We can probably say Elvis probably also belongs in this category. But as far as like a band goes, we're really... Uh, captured the the hearts and the minds of the general public worldwide was the Beatles. And what I, what I find really interesting about the Beatles story is that their mania that built up here in North America, especially in the States, uh, I think was very well orchestrated. And whether Capitol Records knew they were doing this at the time, I don't know. But basically, the Beatles were already breaking over in the UK. And Capitol Records held off on releasing their music here for almost a year. So, you know, this is pre-internet day, you guys, right? So, right, how are you hearing about all this? You're seeing it on the news. You may be reading in the magazines and the newspapers. So the, the Beatles are doing big numbers and everybody's going berserk over in the UK. And we're all kind of sitting here like, well, when are we going to get to experience this band? So it wasn't until uh, VJ Records then began to release some singles here. And specifically, I Want to Hold Your Hand that Beatles music started getting aired, aired on uh, radio stations here in the States and specifically in Washington, D.C., kind of really broke them here. Uh, and that song made it to number one in December of 1963. It's crazy when you think 1963. Uh, and it sold a million copies, right? So that was the big break. And then shortly thereafter, Meet the Beatles and Introducing the Beatles came out in early 64 in February. And then it just took off. And at that point in time, the, the band had to come here. And, and the whole, the big event, which was um, shortly thereafter, uh, they leave Heathrow Airport in the UK to head over here for some dates and some appearances. And they leave the airport there as, you know, absolute superstars with thousands of people at the airport to say goodbye to them. And they show up at JFK Airport here in the U.S., to the exact same type of response from an audience that had never experienced them before. And were, they were still fairly new here. So they get off the plane at JFK and there's thousands and thousands of people here. Then they go and they appear on Ed Sullivan's show. 
and I think like 73 million viewers watched that show. I think 23 million uh, households in general. And again, this is early days of TV, right? Uh, so at the time was the, the largest program ever watched on network television, according to the Nielsen ratings. So they play a couple sold out shows. They go back on Ed Sullivan show and then they go back to the UK, right? So, you know, what I think really helped here is that this was such a short time after the Kennedy assassination. And people here in this country really needed something to make them feel good about things again. And I think the Beatles were the right play in the right place at the right time, and they became the hit band. All of a sudden, everybody's talking about the way they look, the way they dress, the haircuts, all that sort of thing. Albums start coming out. I mean, all this stuff. And, and these guys start selling massive, massive numbers. When they come over and play, they got the movie, right? And uh, just all these groundbreaking records that just do ridiculous business, which of course I'll touch on the numbers in a second. But in addition to all that, they basically helped kickstart a movement called the British Invasion. So in the wake of the Beatles coming over here, now you can, the band I'm going to talk about next, the Rolling Stones, the Kinks, the Who, the Animals, the Dave Clark Five, all these bands come over here and start doing massive business. And, uh, you know, by the time it's all said and done, they had 12 UK uh, studio albums. 17 U.S. albums. Again, there's the whole thing of different releases here and there. Over 50 compilation albums, Martin. Have you ever heard such a thing for a band that only had roughly a dozen albums? Yeah. 50 compilation albums. Uh, all but Yellow Submarine made it to number one in the U.K. And similar results here in the U.S. And they are estimated worldwide sales as of today of 600 million units sold worldwide. Biggest selling artist of all time, band of all time. Uh, and again, another thing I think that adds to the whole legend of this band and a lot of the other uh, groups and artists we're going to talk about today. And you, you kind of mentioned it too, uh, having that face, right? So here, you know, the, all four of them, very recognizable. Lennon and McCartney, obviously the two at the forefront, right? Everybody knows their faces. They're on magazines, they're in newspapers, uh, appearing on all sorts of TV shows and everything like that. So everybody knows the Beatles. Everybody loves the Beatles. Their songs are everywhere. Their albums are everywhere. And, you know, for a number of years, they toured quite a bit and then they kind of stopped. But uh, I also think that too, uh, over time, people love them and their music even more. And we've, we've even lost two of them now. So it, it makes the two surviving members, you know, Sir Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr, they're both like these absolutely legendary figures. And really, and then, you know, you look at the whole Beatlemania thing, right? So of course, let's have cover bands go play on Broadway in New York City and recreate the music of the Beatles. So now if you're in a Beatles cover band, you're going to do big business no matter where you're playing. So it's like, this is like this one band that the whole Messiah complex, the whole idea of legends, that's the Beatles. And it's almost like Beatlemania, which hit in 1963, 1964, almost has never really left us. So there you go. Yeah. So it's got mania right in the title. Right. Um, but, you know, this is the true definition of the whole mania thing. And I mean, most of these, these, the, the, the true mania things started with Elvis, but you've got the girls screaming and crying and peeing themselves. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you've got beetle haircuts. Everybody's getting a beetle haircut. Everybody's getting beetle boots. Yep. Um, so yeah, this is, this is the, uh, the ultimate early example of that you got the, got the bigger than Jesus quote from John Lennon. That's the other thing when you're, when you're looked upon as the Messiah, you know, he, he just, he draws this comparison and it drives everybody crazy because every, every time those guys speak, everybody's listening with bated breath on what they're going to say. Right. So it, yeah. so it is this idea that these guys are super meaningful, like oh, yeah. just put a mic in front of them and everybody's listening. Right. And the drug thing too, right. Oh, is, is it cool to take, is it cool to take acid, right? The Beatles yeah. take acid, right? Why not? Yeah. Right. Is it cool yeah, to play yeah. sitar on, on a rock record? George Harrison does it. Why not? Yeah, right. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. My second one is uh, is pretty modest. It's uh, it's a modest example of this, but uh, but it's a neat sort of philosophical example of this because I think it, it fits uh, in that respect. So it's the clash. Um, you know, the clash. This is there's no mania really in particular around the first album. There's a little bit of mania around punk as a concept. There's really no mania around the second album. It's just a good band and they're making good stuff. But, you know, there, there's kind of um, there's definitely a mania around this album of the idea of 
this is one of these bands that's completely rewriting the rules of rock and roll and saving rock and roll and getting us back to the roots and it's magical and every single critic down the line you know rates this as one of the greatest albums ever made yeah a, a funny thing is that rolling stone magazine uh, yeah in, in 1989 i rated this the top album of the 1980s right and uh and the funny thing is it came out in in the uk in 79 i've always considered it a 79 album why because my canadian copy says 79 on the back uh but apparently it came out in january of 1980 in the states i don't know um, but there's definitely, you know, and this ties in with Elvis mania with the, uh, you know, the uh, parody cover of the first Elvis Presley cover with those letters. Um, you've got this grainy shot of this sort of iconic looking, you know, when you look at these guys, uh, part of their their cool fashion sense was a little bit of a old rock and roller rock rocker rockabilly kind of look sometimes with the slick back hair and sort of the look on stage and that that hero thing right so it had that it it really has that ties to the whole bruce springsteen thing as, as you're coming up so these guys every single critic all your rolling stone and q and robert Criscow and all that rated this such a such a high album and then you know the the mania kind of goes away for the triple album and then it's kind of back for this um again you look at that picture and that's just like, uh, like kind of like, a, you know, an important look and roots. We're all we all look like Johnny Cash sort of uh, look. Right. Um, but, you know, the mania is kind of back uh, in in two forms. Um, you know, when Pete Townsend gives you his blessing and, and the Clash tours as support to the who on a tour there. And then and then they're, um, you know, they're a big band at uh, at uh, the US Festival as well. And they put in this heroic messi messianic sort of performance. And, uh, you know, there's all this stuff about the clash is not for sale, you know, and there, there's all this stuff, but yeah, there, there's all of that. Uh, there's a lot of politics in it too. So, so you're listening to these guys all along and you're thinking, boy, aren't, aren't they smart, you know, knowing all this about the Sandinistas and all this sort of thing. Right. So there's all that to go along with it as well, that there's, that there's subtly, subtly being world leaders of rock and roll at the same time right so so all of that does add to a mystique and a mania about this band but they were never a massive big selling band i mean london calling i think is five million copies around the world or something like that and it went platinum but uh but yeah definitely um you know this is a band that uh that there was some magic ascribed to it let's put it that way rather than just uh you know, hey, we're uh, we're slaughter. We've uh, you know, we, we've got a platinum and a gold and a double platinum or whatever we got. Right. You know, so there's more records. Right. But nobody's yeah. nobody's going to say there was slaughter mania. Right. Yeah. So how, how many years, Martin, are we looking at the clash in their existence? Seventy seven through to uh, about eighty five with Cut the Crap, I think it is. So uh, but the big time. albums. So they do a single, a single, a double, a triple, a single, and then Mick Jones isn't in the last one. And it's this notorious, really crappy album called Cut the Crap um, that uh, that is just Joe Strummer and some new guys kind of thing, more or less. So that that's all it was. But Combat Rock was the big one with Should I Stay or Should I Go? And, yeah. you know, which which is not. It's it's certainly the the hits on that and Rock the Casbah. Neither of those are are we're saving rock and roll type songs. The most of but that is big song. songs though. I mean, yeah, for, but, but it's just, it's just, you know, there's no real magic to ascribe to the band for that, but the magic is, is there, you know, the entire London calling sort of album. And, and like I say, this, uh, this, uh, the way they looked on stage and, and, and the fact that they were, you know, anointed somewhat by Pete Townsend. You ever wonder if the clash were like a little bit too late to the game or a little too early to the game. It's almost, to me, it almost seemed like they, they were always on the verge of breaking big, but either the general audiences were already kind of moved on to other things when their when their music came out, or yeah, vice versa. I don't know. I, 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 know I, I, I've never really thought about it, but I I would say I would say I can't even put them in time because they're so weirdly not of any sort of time. I mean, well, and part true. of that is it's only a few albums, and they just change radically through through them all. Right, like yeah. they're all so different from each other, um, and it was too British. It was too barky. It was, it, it was kind of distant. I mean, the first ones are punky. Um, so, you know, really the only accessible album really, in, you know, in all of that is London calling. 
Um, you know, Combat Rock was the hit album and the two hits were accessible, but the rest of it's not accessible at all. It was just really weird, murky dub and like like early hip hoppy kind of things and very yeah. sparse, very <laughs> experimental. Right. So they were not a very accessible band at all, other than on London Calling. Yeah. And London Calling stylistically is all over the place. I mean, yeah. one of the things that, you know, again, I, I think it's just it's a me thing. But uh, one of the things I don't like about London Calling, it's just like every song is just so completely different than the one before yeah. it. It's a, to me, it's a baffling, confusing album, but I can see the appeal because you get a little bit of everything on that album. What you really don't get is this kind of portrayal of the band as a punk band, which I don't hear any punk on that album really at all. Yeah. And I, I wonder too, if that, if their look and their label as a punk band kind of hurt them in the long run, because really their music, like you said, other than that first album, it's really yeah. all sorts of other things, but that. And the funny thing about London Calling is it's all over the place, but every single song is just conservative rock and roll of one type or another or jazz or whatever, like just rootsy, normal, yeah. predictable yeah. music. I mean, it's there's nothing super strange on it. Right. Yeah. It's just every song is quite different stylistically, but it's all. But it, every one of those songs is like, you know where it's going to go. It's all accessible. Right. Yeah. Like me personally, I love the title track. I think it's a great song. I wanted a whole album of stuff like that. But well, there you go with the mania, you know, the mania moving into the messianic thing. I mean, it looks like they, they look like in that video, they look like um, superheroes kind of right. The lights going around. It's all very dramatic and everything. And it's this, this really political song and apocalyptic. And so, so that's the idea of uh, part of this is like, uh, you know, we're ascribing importance to these bands but there's also i think with a lot of these bands there's it, sometimes it goes over the top and, and it's self-important right yeah 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 no you're 100 you're correct yeah all right so uh i'm kind of going chronologically here so i mentioned them before so the rolling stones is my next pick uh again part of the original british invasion along with the beatles and the other bands that i mentioned uh they got their start in the very early 60s releasing albums and singles that are mostly covers of old r&b and blues songs and whatnot it really wasn't until they started writing their own songs uh, that they really really started to take off in popularity and really start to become the big band that they have been ever since right 60 some odd years later uh and they you know Songs like Satisfaction, Ruby Tuesday, Let's Spend the Night Together, Get Off of My Cloud, many, many others. The UK and the US were listening. They came over here quite a few times uh, in those early years. Uh, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards very early on became the kind of focal point of the band, as well as Brian Jones for a few years. He ultimately uh, left us in 1969. They also did the Ed Sullivan Show appearances, drawing big ratings, sold out shows, uh, they were also always in the news. I mean, that I think, too, we have to, and I think Martin's going to talk about a band in a little bit that also has this mystique. Uh, getting in trouble with the law and issues with drugs and things like that. I mean, they were getting arrested for drug possession and always in the news, always some legalities going on with the band. But, you know, a lot of best-selling albums all over the place. You know, December's Children. These are some of their kind of like mid-60s, mid to late 60s albums. Uh, and then in the 70s, you got like albums like Sticky Fingers, and, you know, Let It Bleed, Beggar's Banquet, and Exile on Main Street. And there's this whole story about the making of this album in France and their tax exiles and the whole mystique about them, too. I think a lot of these acts of the 70s were really big. There's this whole mystery and mystique about them. Uh, like I said, they they played some huge shows. Uh, this adds another thing to the mystique of the Rolling Stones. So they played uh, right at literally days after Brian Jones passed away and Mick Taylor came into the band. They go and play this enormous free concert in Hyde Park, like 250,000 people. Uh, at the end of the decade, they play probably what is considered the last festival of the decade and kind of took it out on a sour note. Altamont, which of course had that very violent ending and just the whole festival is looked at as one big catastrophe. Uh, like I said, the 70s, do big business, more drug bust, all that sort of thing. Uh, people coming and going from the band, uh, they, they go through a couple of years where even though the albums are selling really well, maybe the furor of the Rolling Stones has died down a little bit. They have the huge 1972 tour. But then late in the decade, they come out with Some Girls. And all of a sudden, the Rolling Stones are, are cool again. And this starts off a trajectory of, you know, million plus selling albums, big tours, right? 
throughout the 80s. Uh, they continue to draw, but then they kind of, you know, Jagger and Richards aren't kind of getting along. So they're kind of not doing much of anything. Solo albums are happening, but they come back. They do steel wheels. And all of a sudden, you know, once again, the Stones are a big, huge stadium act. And that, you know, that was a very notable tour because they had all this ridiculous merchandising and the stage show was enormous. And, you know, playing football and baseball stadiums, you know, big, big stuff. Uh, and still, to this day, one of the biggest draws in rock and roll. So, like, the Stones can go away for five years and come back and say, hey, we've either releasing an album or, like, right now they got the new song is out in the video. That album's coming out soon. Everybody's talking about the Stones again uh, when they go on tour, booking all the big places. So it's almost like no matter how old they are, the Stones are still ridiculous superstars that draw all sorts of craziness and furor about everybody's talking about them they're talking about the song talking about the video talking about the tour there's always something going on with them right and if you look at their their career 31 studio albums 13 live albums 28 compilations they've sold over 200 million records to date worldwide 37 top 10 albums across all the different releases nine number one albums in the u.s 10 in the uk in fact, Sticky Fingers through Tattoo You were all number one releases in the States. Mm -hmm. Eight number one hits, Billboard charts, yeah. and generally regarded as the number two best-selling band of all time, only behind the band I just talked about before. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, the whole kind of um, the Mick Jagger and Keith Richards as these kind of legendary figures that like, you know, will live on forever right i mean the, the guys just for keith all the drug issues and the the addiction years and he's everybody always jokes about how he's going to outlive everybody and mick jagger at 80 some odd years old still can run around on stage just like he was you know 50 years old or 40 years old right and it's just uh it's just crazy when you think about the longevity of this band and all they've done and how they still are looked at as those kind of like mythological figures yeah yeah i'm 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 Imagine that, uh, you know, if you had to pick the correct answer of the height of Stones mania, it would be them coming over as part of the British invasion thing. But for someone my age, um, who's uh, I, ne I never get to say this younger than, uh, you know, so someone uh, who would say that, um, you know, for me, the mania actually overlaps with the old college years thing, because uh, I remember my first year of university. I mean, Tattoo You was just such a big album. Everybody was playing it. And I knew you were going to talk about this. So I, I thought I'd mention um, this idea that, you know, kinks, this is where it tails off state of uh, confusion into word of mouth. I wonder if the kinks is um, success around this time with, uh, you know, basically low budget. 1979 goes gold one for the road the double live album then they go give the people what they want august 81 gold that is the so that album and the stones album were played constantly in at, at ubc my first year university. Oh, it's like the british invasion rub from the stones right on the well kinks. yes so so i'm wondering yeah. if the stones success caused the kinks success and i also wonder if the stones invented classic rock I mean, by them coming back and being big again with with some girls, emotional rescue tattoo. You, I wonder if that's the start of classic rock, right? Because my next one's going to argue that point a little bit as well. It's, it's going to sort awesome. of say the same thing. So, uh, so yeah, I, I often thought. Uh, well, I I didn't often think. I've really just came up with this this morning. But uh, did did the Stone situation uh, sweep up the Kinks along uh, with them being an well, associated band, right? To your point, Martin, too, uh, the Kinks were never a big band here until that point in time, right? Mm -hmm. So I've talked to a lot of folks from the UK who are longtime Kinks fan who never understand our fascination here in, in North America with those late 70s, early 80s Kinks albums, which many of us love because that's when the Kinks became popular here. And it's no fault of ours, right? They just were never a big band here. So if... I think it's great for the Kinks that they finally started making some money here and gaining some interest and in selling some records and, and tours and things. And if, if it's the stones they have to thank for it, that's not a bad thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So my, my next one uh, does sort of make the similar point, but uh, I'm not going to say this band invented classic rock, but I'm, I'm going to stick with that idea. The Rolling Stones invented classic rock in 1978 with some girls basically. Right. Um, 
so uh so the doors uh so the doors mania um i also am too young again uh to know about the original doors mania and how much of a mania it is but i can tell you i was on the ground for the second coming of the doors see there's that term the second coming right jim morrison uh you know jim morrison uh definitely mania about him important poet all this sort of thing so i i made a little timeline here so uh, November 27th, 78, American Prayer uh, comes out and goes platinum. Um, you know, two years later, nominated for a Grammy. Um, Roadhouse Blues Live was a hit. So this is long after uh, Jim's death and the end of the doors. Um, but American Prayer is just him spouting some poetry, some tapes on uh, reading his poetry, and they put some music behind it. But it's kind of considered a Doors album. Uh, May 19th, 1979, The End is one of the most memorable things about the movie apocalypse now um so that that was a huge deal 1980 uh you get the no one here gets out alive very popular biography of jim morrison uh by jerry hopkins and danny sugarman so um so we're so we're building to something here no one knows really what's what's going on there's just like some sort of little doors revival uh but september 1980 the doors debut re-enters the billboard charts uh and electra says uh all the doors albums are selling better than on the release date uh, kind of thing. Um, October 13th, 1980. So, uh, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still in high school. We're moving into uh, getting to university, uh, which again, uh, this is my huge memory of this because I remember playing lots and lots of doors uh, around this time as well. Um, so the greatest hits album comes out. Uh, Red, well, I got some of this stuff here. Um, Greatest hits, uh, the the red, black, and white greatest hits album goes number one on Billboard, um, and on the charts for two years. It eventually, goes triple platinum. Um, you know, this is these huge, huge records coming out. So, so again, we've got this idea of like this is an oldie moldy, really weird, creepy old old band. Um, you know, unlike the Rolling Stones, where who are their their own version of sounding inept and old and creepy, right? They're they're definitely an old timey band too, right? Oh, but yeah. you've got these two old classic rock bands, and all of a sudden it's like there's a classic rock format. It'd be interesting to hear when they started using that term, right? Um yeah. But September 17th, 1981, the, the uh, number 352 uh, issue of Rolling Stone has Jim Morrison on the cover, declares he's hot, he's sexy, and he's dead. Um, so there's your there's your getting on the cover of the Rolling Stone. It means, you know, there's a mania going on, right? Um, uh, An American Prayer, the poetry book is republished, uh, maybe in a dodgy pirate edition, 1983. Uh, October 17th, 1983, Alive She Cried comes up. Out glory number 18 on the billboard charts that album goes gold 1985 the best of the doors uh, is that what this one is yeah the, the best of the doors this thing yep, this right. this album uh a hits yeah. album double hits album 1985 is a diamond album yeah crazy right um and uh 1985 the lords and the new creatures is reissued i remember getting these jim morrison poetry books as as new releases because they were they were super rare expensive you know little poetry books kind of like the phil linet situation right um may 1987 you get live at the hollywood bowl 1988 wilderness the lost writings of jim morrison comes out 1990 american night the writings of jim morrison comes out march 1st 1991 the doors biopic biopic comes out with val kilmer um and may 21st 1991 uh in concert another live album goes platinum so definitely uh the big deal there out of all of them really i think the two things that that spark it more than anything are uh are um the biography because there weren't a lot of rock biographies back then and getting on the cover of the rolling stone although rolling stones already re is reporting what's happening like that whole that whole article is about how oh, why are these guys big again kind of thing yeah uh and then the power of a song in a movie i guess right which we know nowadays right um but i guess that was a big deal uh because apocalypse now was a huge hit right yeah 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 this is uh this is an amazing band that in my lifetime has had these waves of intense popularity, even though they were basically done uh, when I was a little child. Right. And it's just crazy when you think about it, you mentioned, I mean, yeah, the book, the, uh, the Rolling Stone magazine, the movie, I remember Martin after that movie came out, I would go into like a Sam Goody store or a Best Buy. Or, well, I mean, not Best Buy because it's a little too early for that. But like any music store, all of a sudden you're seeing Jim Morrison posters and Doors t-shirts all over the place. And 
what I find, and I've talked to a lot of young people over the years who obviously weren't around when the doors were popular, weren't even around when the doors were really popular on the radio in the early days of classic rock radio, and all of a sudden discovering this old, old, creepy, weird band, like you absolutely said very correctly, and discovering something to love in this band and that you wouldn't think, right? I would think that, uh, you know, it, it's amazing. I know young kids who have no idea who the Beatles are. Can, couldn't name one song, don't know who they are, never heard of them, but yet they know the Doors and they know Jim Morrison and they can recite all sorts of Doors songs. Why is that? Yeah. Why is this weird band, have they captured the hearts and minds of so many generations for over 60 years? Does it make any sense at all? Yeah. It's strange, right? I mean, yeah. it's just it's just remarkable how there's always going to be a, a, a wave and a mania around the doors and around Jim Morrison. And maybe it's because he was just such a remarkable mythical figure and he died so young and the whole mystique of Jim Morrison is just uh, is just so great. It just can never be kept under wraps at all. I don't know. But yeah, yeah and I, I would I would defend his writings. There's a lot of people who put down his writings and his poetry and his lyrics and stuff. But I think I think they're awesome. I mean, I, I, I you know, for, for somebody to, to go and do that um, take takes a lot of a lot of bravery and it's just really, really good stuff. I mean, I. I think I think people who put it down are just like, uh, you know, don't don't want anybody to even try anything deep in rock and roll or whatever, yeah. or or they're jealous of it. I don't know. Um, but uh, but I think that's a big part of the Messiah complex thing. It's like, you know, in in, in crude terms, you could say here, here's like like this wise guru who's written kind of a Bible. Right. You know, all, all of all of his writings add up to something, you know, super cool and mystical. Right. Yeah. And, and me as not being a lyric guy, I always found Morrison's lyrics to be just really cool because they're just kind of at times they're so ambiguous. At times they're very, very simple. And it's just I don't need to. Sorry. Right, what is he trying to get to here or get at here? Right. Um, and it just the style of the music perfectly fit not only his writing style, but his vocal style. I don't know. I think I think the, the doors were always a marriage made in heaven with all those guys. And, um, you know, like I. I was doing a did a show here on the channel a couple of days ago where I was talking about the first album and uh, and the band in general about how they, they never added a bass player right. There's just those guys. And I'm like, could it ever been anything other than those four guys? Right? Yeah. Would that have that, that wouldn't have worked? I think it just as history shows it obviously, but I don't think uh, you ever want to go back and change that. Right? If you could go back in time, do you want to change the Doors lineup? You really can't. It was perfect as it was. Um, yeah, fascinating band. I could talk about the Doors all day long, and it just it's a testament, right? I mean, you talk about that greatest hits album, the double album, selling all those copies. You mean to tell me that most Doors Doors fans didn't already have all those songs? Of course yeah. they did. Some of them were buying that again, but no, it was legions and legions of new listeners who were all of a sudden discovering the Doors all over again. And I bet you if they were to put out some deluxe Doors set next year, it would still sell a million plus copies. I mean, that's just, that's just the way it is, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, my next pick, kind of three, a three in one. I'm going to spend most of the time talking about one guy, but um, I'm going to squeeze a couple others in there. Uh, Bruce Springsteen. So here's a guy that got started. Of course, he's from New Jersey, right? You don't really hear about New Jersey much when you talk about those uh, kind of melting pot of musical artists that came out of a certain place. I think uh, we, we hear it more lately, right? Or the last 20, 30 years. But uh, Bruce Springsteen basically put uh, New Jersey on the map. A uh, guy started off in various different rock bands, then gets signed to a major label and uh, is touted as kind of like the next Bob Dylan, right? Do we need another folky guy? Do we need a a New Jersey folky guy, whatever, right? But he comes out with, uh, you know, greetings from Asbury Park and then puts together the E Street Band, right? So we get albums like this. All of a sudden, it's more of a band. He's the leader, but it's more of a band. They're playing this kind of interesting style of music, which incorporates, you know, rock and funk and R&B and blues and folk. And, you know, guy has sold, all told, over 140 million albums worldwide, right? But it's really like with this album, Born to Run, that he becomes a true superstar. You got Darkness on the Edge of Town. You got The River, Nebraska, all big, big sellers. Um, Born to Run sold 7 million copies in the U.S. alone. Um, then this album comes out in 1984, Born in the USA. 
30 million copies worldwide, 17 million here in the States or in North America. Uh, huge tours. All of a sudden, Bruce Springsteen is a stadium act, right? It's Bruce Springsteen, the E Street Band, absolute stadium act. But he's got like these personalities in the band that are become almost as big as him. Clarence Clemens, Stevie Van Zandt, right? You got Max Weinberg, all these other musicians that kind of stuck with him for most of his uh, career. And uh, 21 studio albums, 23 live albums. His more recent albums still chart really, really high. He can tour once every in a blue moon, and especially here on the East Coast, uh, can do you know a week's worth of sold out shows at Giant Stadium, which is now called MetLife Stadium, eighty thousand people a day. Right, that's the kind of kind of uh, crowds that he draws. He was also very important here in this area after 9-11. He was, uh, you know, big voice in kind of helping the world heal and helping the U.S. heal and specifically the East Coast heal uh, after 9-11. And so he puts out this album, The Rising, which does big, big business. Bruce Mania is back once again because we all want to heal from this horrible, horrible, tragic event. Uh, he plays, you know, sold out shows all over the place. Um, and I think he also... In another way, he sparks up mania, maybe sometimes in a not so positive fashion. He's been very outspoken politically in more recent times, right? So and now it's like people still talk about Springsteen, but some people don't like him for his political views or they praise him for his political views. Um, but, you know, that's kind of all part of the whole thing that comes with Springsteen in his older years. But uh, and, you know, classic songs, of course, that'll constantly mention classic rock radio. He's another guy, the staple of classic rock radio, Born to Run, right? Hungry Heart, Born in the USA, the title track, Dance in the Dark, Cover Me, all sorts of great tracks uh, forever be played on uh, classic rock radio. So Bruce Springsteen kind of paved the way, I don't have anything to show, uh, for another big act from New Jersey, which is Bon Jovi, okay, who kind of started out as kind of like this early 80s glam metal band and then became more of like kind of like arena rock super band throughout the 80s into the 90s. They've sold over 130 million albums worldwide um john bon jovi richie sambora main songwriters focal point singer guitar player in the band also became kind of the sex symbols of the band john of course also has broken into uh, movies and television he's done all of that uh slippery when wet new jersey keep the faith huge huge albums big selling tours you know when john plays around here it's still like a mega mega event um and also, you talked earlier on when we were talking about the Beatles, this whole thing of drawing women to concerts, right? Bon Jovi has a huge female fan base uh, as well, which really helps. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and songs that forever will be played on radio, right? You got uh, You Give Love a Bad Name, Live on a Prayer, Better Roses, Keep the Faith, I'll Be There for You. Also, one of the bands that helped really push the whole idea of power ballad, right? The ballads always did really, really well. And lastly, I do want to mention John Mellencamp, or originally John Cougar Mellencamp, who were probably not on the success of either of these two guys, but another artist, kind of like Bruce and Bon Jovi to an extent, that kind of brought this whole thing of Americana, right? Tom Petty, I might as well mention as well, in the same thing, where it really appealed to kind of a working class, middle class Americans, especially the, across the heartland. Uh, he from Indiana, right said 22 top 40 hits martin i never knew that that's that's a pretty great achievement for a guy that maybe isn't on the level of a bon jovi or a springsteen nominated for 13 grammy awards he sold over 60 million albums worldwide 30 here in the states founding member of farm aid uh 24 studio albums made it into the rock and roll hall of fame in 2008 hurt so good jack and diane pink houses legendary songs uh, and I think he's another one of those guys that probably a couple of uh, good breaks here and there, and we would forever be talking about him on the same breath as Tom Petty, Springsteen, and Bon Jovi. So there you yeah. go. Yeah, it's interesting. If if I think about the word mania and how it applies to Bon Jovi and John Mellencamp, to me, I don't think there was a Bon Jovi mania when they're just getting massive. Uh, to me, to me, I, I like the idea of uh, saying that there's this quiet critical mania when they when they finally became accepted as serious artists sort of thing and and they, they, they people all decided they're going to be a part of pop culture forever yeah. um so that's when it mattered for them john mellencamp was kind of like a 
like a big star with a lot of excitement around him. But again, I feel like his mania or or the part it's it's that quiet, critical mania thing where he's he's looked upon as a wise man. Um, so so it it's three or four albums in for John Mellencamp. It's three or four albums in and and not certainly on the same artistic level for Bon Jovi. Um, but but that three or four albums in for John Mellencamp is a little bit like Born to Run. Uh, and clash London calling where it's like the critical acclaim type thing. Yeah. The, 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 I'm um, sa- we're saving rock and roll. We're getting it back to its roots. We're refining our compass, our values. Right. Um, so, you know, people thought that John Mellencamp is a serious artist. Right. Yeah. And Bruce Springsteen is a serious artist um, early. So he did it first. Um, but then his mania his his uh, his born in the USA mania is almost like a Beatles mania, and it's very much like a, this guy could have been president, right? Oh yeah, at that I mean, time, at that oh, time, oh, had, had oh, yeah. he shown political stripes and and really like you know grabbed that and ran with it sort of thing, he'd be president, right? Uh, for for those years there, so so that's a totally unique, different kind of mania uh, than than those other guys right and you know you it, when it comes to john mellencamp you bring up a good point about the whole critical acceptance right because in my mind uh and what i thought was fascinating about doing some research on him in my mind i never perceived john mellencamp as a big selling artist but i always remember how much he was a critic's darling so to me i always thought ah he's one of those guys that the critics loved him but nobody bought his music but when you really look into it this guy was very, very successful. He's he's had yeah. a very, very good career that any other artist or band would be completely jealous to have had, even though yeah. to some people, maybe not as household a word as a or a name as a Springsteen or a Tom Petty or a Bon Jovi. Right. But he's up there. He, he really is up there a little more on the quiet side. Yeah. All right. I'll move on to my next one. Boy, we're, we're having this go a little long, aren't we? Um, Norman and I were worried that we this would only be like a half hour episode. Well, exactly. So yeah. Exactly. So my next one that definitely fits this is a U2 mania. Um, and again, it's a, it's a little bit like that's, it's, it's like some of these, maybe it's a little bit like Bruce Springsteen. I'd imagine um, that uh, they start, there's this, there's this excitement about them immediately kind of thing. Uh, the first album only ever went uh, platinum way late. I mean, it was gold, even gold and, and platinum late, but you know, they, they start as this sort of, um, this sort of like well-respected, interesting. And there's a little bit of a Christian thing going and a Catholic thing and really interesting guitar and, and vocals and stuff. So they have boy, uh, 82 in October, 83 war war is where you start getting the, the messianic view upon, uh, upon you too. Uh, you've got new year's day and Sunday, yeah. bloody Sunday and all this and the, and the stilted cool, like, you know, military drumming and stuff and edge guitar and that. Right. Um, and, um, and you know, under under a blood red sky is this uh, is this iconic Red Rocks uh, live performance where it's all really moody and dark and you know fire and and all this stuff where where there's this importance uh, starting to be attached to them, right? Um, so it goes gold uh, February eighty four. So war war goes gold uh, right away and platinum pretty much right away February eighty five. It goes platinum. Um, and under a blood red sky, gold and then platinum in eighty five. So I pinpoint almost like the beginning of the ma- the mania with you two uh as as uh in 1985 essentially um then you get the un- unforgettable fire um 84 uh, september 84 goes gold by december 84 platinum by february 85 weirdly not double platinum until 1994 they do a big certification way, way late um but the big album that kind of breaks it open uh, is the Joshua Tree 87. It's five times platinum by the end of 87, um, but not six times platinum till 95. But a massive, massive band. You got Where the Streets Have No Name, With or Without You, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. So at this point, um, it's uh they're they're like uh they're like a true you know with their with their catholic and christian roots and all this and and these and these sort of timeless lyrics and and these activism type lyrics and all this they're certainly looked at as a, as a really wise band right a messianic so super important band the critics love them the people love them they're like these these hit songs are spiritually cleansing everybody and all this stuff right um so there's definitely a a mania about you too that that I I remember feeling in the mid '80s like everybody was on board everybody's loving this band they're gonna save the world they're saving rock and roll all that stuff we talk about like 
fixing the moral compass on rock and roll hair metals happening but over here there's the this here's the serious music over here right yeah. that that kind of thing um you know and then they they keep keep being big rattle and hums a little bit of a misstep but it it does really well but then they reinvent themselves with octung baby and zeropa and all that they're now they're kind of like a weird noisy dancey loud uh you know they're, they're just they're they're becoming a band where they where the um all the messianic important or self-important aspects of them are kind of put aside and they, they just become this uh, strange pop culture, trying a bunch of different things for the rest of their lives. Right. Uh, sort of thing. So, so the mania goes away. Um, but, uh, but definitely that was a massive, massive example of rock and roll mania in the, uh, in the mid eighties with these guys. Yeah. And too, now we're in the era where we can talk about it, where uh, all of a sudden MTV is a factor with some of these artists, right? I mean, yeah. you two were on MTV all the time. You couldn't miss them. So they were on your television 24 seven whenever you wanted to see them. Right. I mean, uh, and that also added to it as well. Yeah. It's, it's funny. Uh, and some of these bands are more modern bands, modern meaning post seventies uh, bands. Uh, when you start to look up some of the, this information on number of albums and album sales and singles and all that, a lot of times they list the videos now too. And some of these artists had tons and tons of videos, like, like literally 50, 70, a hundred of them. So it's just, it's crazy. Uh, it's, that was just part of adding to the mystique and adding to the mania as well. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. So as I'm going chronologically, let's move into the eighties here with uh, Prince. So highly influential multi-instrumentalist singer, songwriter, producer, uh, blended R and B and funk and soul and new wave and hip hop and synth pop and blues all into one really unique sound. There was never anybody like Prince. Uh, obviously took his influences from the great soul and funk artists that came before him. Uh, 1982, you know, 1999, sells 4 million copies. All of a sudden, he's well on his way. Title track and a Little Red Corvette become big hits and plastered all over MTV. Uh, and along with Michael Jackson, one of the two first like black artists to really break big on mtv into the video generation and those two guys were all over mtv throughout the decade um purple rain film comes out the soundtrack to the film comes out um this you know makes him a worldwide sensation it sells 13 million copies here tw spent 24 weeks on the number one spot on the billboard charts when doves cry let's go crazy the title track all number one hits um, the album won two Grammys, the film won an Academy Award, uh, and then into the 80s, he continually, you know, releasing top 10 albums, you know, critically acclaimed albums, uh, you know, wherever he appears, there's Prince Mania, he's touring, he's even goes and changes his name almost, right? He doesn't want to be called uh, Prince anymore. So he's just called the symbol, the artist, right? So who who in their right mind would do that? Uh, he's got this kind of androgynous thing going on, but he becomes a sex symbol, right? You can see it on his album covers and everything. Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, everybody's talking about Prince. He stops touring for a while. He becomes very mysterious. But Prince Mania is another one of the, he's another one of those guys that kind of comes and goes whenever he decides to do something, whether it's a new album, does a tour, single release, appears at the Grammy Awards, appears at the, uh, you know, the Oscars, whatever. Prince is back in the news and, uh, you know, the way he dressed, the way he expressed himself, even like when Prince passed away uh 20 in 2016 at the age of 57 right all of a sudden it was prince mania once again um and an, uh, sadly another guy who we lost to uh, addiction and whatnot but uh yeah his legend just continues to grow uh whether he maybe he's not quite at michael jackson levels but i think for this style of music i think he's pretty close and uh sold over 150 million albums worldwide throughout his career i mean it's a ridiculously ridiculously high number so i definitely wanted to include him in on uh, today's discussion yeah. Yeah. I think what contributes a lot to his mania is the movie uh, and just, you know, pictures mean a lot, right? Pictures yeah. and Hollywood means a lot. So yeah, that's why video really helps with, uh, with this stuff as well. But yeah, to being the movie and the album at the same time, and people love the fact that uh, there was a lot of guitar and all that sort of thing too. Right. So yeah. I think yeah. that was his, his moment of, of mania. So, oh, okay. Yeah. My, my last one here. <laughs> um, is a little bit of a grunge treatise, but uh, it's kind of interesting. I don't really feel there's any mania around Soundgarden. There's no mania around Alice in Chains. And even this band here in Nirvana, 
Um, I would I would say um, mania. No, I mean, I, I don't think uh, even even how everybody felt about Kurt. It was, they were just kind of this nerdy power trio band. They were great. You know, you one could say that that they had a hand in the reinvention of punk rock again. And you you get uh, Green Day and Offspring and Rancid. And uh, boy, I had some uh, notes. Yeah. Green Day. Dookie goes diamond. Um, the Offspring. You've got Dexter Holland, who has a little bit of a voice like Kurt Cobain uh, smash their third album goes uh, tr uh, six times platinum uh, Americana goes five times platinum. So my point there is that I'm, I'm giving Nirvana some extra credit beyond just being the awesome Nirvana uh, to, you know, people say it's uh, punk rock. Uh, they save punk rock or punk rock is back again, but I wouldn't say there's a lot of mania around this band. I think the mania is reserved for one guy in one band, Eddie Vedder in this band. <laughs> um, so this is a band where I definitely remember Pearl Jam is saving rock and roll. Eddie Vedder is saving rock and roll. There's uh, this is the most important band that's, uh, you know, existed in a long, long time. They're the most important band since U2 is what everybody basically said. Um, you know, the 10 album. So you've got 10 comes out August 10th, 1991, double platinum within a year. 13 times platinum now, six times platinum by December 93. So this was a big, huge band. But, um, you know, in the in the uh, in the character of Eddie Vedder, you had, um, you know, these serious lyrics. It was very uh, open, heart on the sleeve sort of lyrics. It's almost like you could talk about depression and things like that. Um, even the band probably was the most um, the most characteristic with grunge fashion out of all these bands as well. I mean, they looked really grunge, um, but then you had verses come out um, and uh, 93, late 93 platinum by January. Uh, no, five times platinum by January 6, 94, apparently. So somehow this managed to go five times platinum <laughs> in about two months. So this went crazy. I remember. So that's that's a real expression of mania, how fast this sold uh, and how much of a hit album this was. This is now at seven times platinum. And then you had uh, the likes of Vitalogy. This is almost like a little bit like no matter what kind of crap they turn out, um, because this this band became somewhat derided for wow, we can put anything out and we'll just put it on an album. They, 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 they started to adopt a little bit of a punk rock spirit to what they did. Right. And, and just, you know, experimented and seemed very spontaneous and stuff, but even Vitalogy, November 22nd, 94, four times platinum by February 95. So also in two months, uh, this went from uh, zero sales to uh, four times platinum. Um, so I think when it comes to grunge, I feel like there's a little bit of a mania around Billy Corgan as well, but I wouldn't say there was a mania around Stone Temple Pilots. But uh, yeah, if I was to apply that that Messiah, that that second coming of Christ idea to anything to do with grunge, it would be Eddie Vedder. Yeah, I think um, out of all the bands you mentioned, they were the ones that really stood out. I think there was there was almost a mania about the whole scene in general. But none of them kind of stood out as we are the poster child for this scene other than them. And I I mean, the fear around those first two albums, I will admit I was on board. I really enjoyed those first two uh, Pearl Jam albums. I, I think they fell off a cliff after that. But uh, yeah, and there was something, and, you know, to his relationship with Neil Young, considered the, the godfather of grunge, I think helped a lot. A lot of older listeners to get into Pearl Jam. So, uh, yeah, it, it's a good pick. I think they definitely fit. Yeah, I mean, he's basically the one guy out of all of that, um, all of that great, amazing music. But he's the one the one guy almost. Well, I mean, the band themselves uh, are 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 put on that pedestal with your Springsteens and your and your U2s. Right. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. All right. So my last pick for today is one of my favorite bands of all time. Not really, but uh, they deserve to be mentioned here. Guns N' Roses. Uh, so, you know, of course, that first album comes out in 1987. That, that Crazy when you think about it, that album took like a year to really hit its true peak. Uh, you know, the Welcome to the Jungle single, of course, kind of started it all. And Sweet Child of Mine went to number one in the Billboard charts and they never looked back after that. Um, but Appetite for Destruction, you know, sold 18 million copies here in the States, 30 million worldwide. Uh, they became a, you know, they went from opening up for a lot of the big bands of the time and they started became headliners. They came out with GNR Lies a year later. That sold pretty well, but not as good, right? Because that's kind of like a weird little collection of stuff, right? 
but man, they kicked off the nineties in a big way. And I would argue that the real guns and roses mania was probably in 1990, 91 to 93. Exactly. Um, yep. I agree. Yep. I, I mean, yeah, it's just, they, they were huge. Then use your illusion one and two come out on the same day. Uh, they debut at one and two on the charts. They sold like, you know, 35 million combined, 14 million here in the States, uh, tour in stadiums. The tour lasted two years you know, then all of a sudden, all the, the, you know, again, they become almost like the Aerosmith and the Rolling Stones of the 90s, right? You got the two front men, Axel and Slash. Do they like each other? Do they not? Who's on drugs? Who's getting busted for this? Who's dating the supermodels? Who's getting divorced? I mean, who's in the band? Who's out of the band? There's all this stuff going about. Uh, then they released the Spaghetti Incident in 93. Already the cracks are showing. I mean, it's really only what they're, if you count Use Your Illusion 1 and 2 and you do or don't count GNR Lives as a full album, it's like what, their third album and they're doing a covers album, right? It sells, it's the worst selling album of all time, right? It barely squeaks out platinum. Slash leaves, the band's in disarray. Axel kind of fronts this band as a, as a solo artist almost, even though he keeps the name. Chinese Democracy comes out like a million years late in 2008. But then... They get into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2012. They reunite in 2015. And now all of a sudden, when, Ax when Axel and Slash are apparently getting along again, when they choose to go out and tour, they still capture the magic. They sell out all over the place. They, we still don't have another album by them. So I think there's still, there's not the mania there was, but there's still a big deal, uh, even though they're basically just playing all the old hits and the old songs everybody knows. But I think their true mania period was 91 to 93 when they were pretty much on top of the rock world. And another thing that I think also is important to, to note about Guns N' Roses, whether you love them or not, uh, they helped kind of rock and roll move out of the 80s, which was at the end of the 80s, it was all hair metal. And they brought kind of bluesy, traditional hard rock music back into the forefront uh, amidst all the popular grunge and alternative that was happening around, like kind of you know, true old style rock and roll. So I think that's uh, a lot of people really look back at them uh, in a positive fashion because of all that. But yeah, early 90s, certainly lots of mania surrounding Guns N' Roses. Yeah, I totally agree. Like that eight to 12 month period after the late 1981 release date of use your illusion one or two. I mean, they just seemed like the biggest band in the world for a while there. Right. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. November rain was played on MTV constantly. I mean, you couldn't get away without seeing that. Um, you know, Axel was dating that sort of was Stephanie Seymour at the time. Right. You know, she was in the video and it's, yeah, you, you couldn't get away from guns and roses, no matter where you turned. They were on all the magazine covers uh did we talk about rolling stone magazine how many times were they in rolling stone or on the cover like it's every time you turned around right so yeah, yeah couldn't escape me. yeah yeah i remember going downtown and in, in toronto here i think i've told this story before but you had a choice uh if you went to hmv you, you bought use your illusion one you got use your your two three uh free uh, or you went across the street i think it was sam the record man or sunrise if you bought both of them, you got a Guns N' Roses T-shirt. So, uh -huh. uh, but yeah, that was that was a massive time for that. And and I think a lot of the mania has to do with the train wreck, the Motley Crue type train wreck of the band, right? It was just like, yeah. you know, they just always look sweaty and drunk and drugged out and uh, on the verge of exhaustion, right? And Slash yeah. always had the cigarette hanging out of his mouth and all that stuff. Sunglasses, like, top hat, and cigarette, and the yeah, less yeah, ball, yeah. right? It's and just the most the, rock and roll looking thing, right? Yeah, well, I mean, because Martin, I think the Guns N' Roses came out at a time period where we weren't producing a lot. You mentioned Eddie Vedder before. This is like almost like the last wave of the true rock stars like we know them from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, right? Because now are we producing all that many rock stars in that traditional sense anymore? Not really. And I would argue that Axel slash Eddie Vedder and maybe a handful of others, Kurt Cobain, certainly another one, uh, Chris Cornell, maybe the last of the, the true rock stars like we remember them from the old days the bad boys of rock right back when rock stars were bad boys right you don't see that so much anymore and then the movie and the, the books and all that kind of stuff so every time one of those come out oh guns and roses mania begins again right yeah so yeah cool. all right uh martin update on uh contrarians and uh podcast and books what do you got for us well, let's see. Um, yeah, got a, got the History and Five Songs with Martin Popoff audio podcast. The last one that just came out was called uh, uh, Recalled Reactions from 1976. So on the very first albums I remember getting as new releases, 
book wise, this is still doing real well. So the Blue Oyster Cult panel book, people are loving this. I'm getting a lot of good reviews. And uh, you have the Who Quadrophenia book. So so this this big uh, deal here. Yeah, let me get that right way up. There you go. Um, so yeah, this thing is uh, is doing well as well. So those are brand new just in martinpopoff.com and Contrarians. We've got new stuff all the time. We just did a panel on The Cure and uh, you were on our last album cover show. That was really cool. Time Machine album covers. That's right. That's and, um, and we did a weird one last night about, uh, like I say, about this, what bands changed your personality or philosophy? It was kind of all over the place, but that one will be up soon. So yep, what's going cool. on? Lots of good stuff. And, and I know we don't normally do it, but uh, I'd like Martin to give everybody a little preview of what we're going to be talking about next Friday. We actually just decided this right before we taped this show. Yeah. So I think yeah, it's, it's going to be pretty cool. cool so idea. so I, I did uh, on my history and five songs, I did uh, this band's police album and where, because there's only five and it's history and five songs. It was, so it's different than what we're doing here because what we're doing here is going to be even more interesting. Uh, we're going to, we're going to say, uh, this album is this band's Led Zeppelin album, and we're going to go through all 10 Led Zeppelin albums. So we're including Song Remains the Same in Coda. And uh, and we're going to each come up with two examples of albums by other bands that uh, this is this band's Houses of the Holy. This is this band's Led Zeppelin for this, this band's presence. Uh, so, yeah, taking into account the, you know, the characteristics of those eight different Zeppelin albums plus the two. We're going to come up with two examples each and say, this is why we think uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, kick Tracy's or slaughters, uh, you know, uh, physical graffiti. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. I think it's a really cool concept. And I think that the reason why I wanted Martin to uh, announce it ahead of time is because it gives everybody a week to kind of think about it. Cause I think it might be cool for everybody to maybe put together your own pick. So take it. And the Led Zeppelin is a perfect choice because each of their albums, for the most part, are a little different, right? And have unique characteristics. So it'll make you think, well, what bands had an album, like I'll use Led Zeppelin Three as an example, mostly an acoustic folky album. Well, what band maybe had their own acoustic folky album, which does, which kind of sits really weird in the catalog. What band had their own physical graffiti, a sprawling classic two album uh, set of songs, right? What band had, you know, an album like Coda of where after they were done, they put together some things that were left over, that sort of thing. So what band had that dynamite first album, you know, so that sort. So put your thinking caps on and come up with like two examples for each of the Led Zeppelin albums of other bands who maybe did similar type things in their catalog. Right. So uh, Martin and I have a lot of homework to do over the next week, but I think this is a really cool concept. The explanation and, is a lot and even come up with a good title for it, it's going to be kind of tough. So there's going to be yeah, parentheses yeah. all over the place and who knows, right? Yeah, we'll figure it out. That, that's usually decided the night before the morning of we take. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, in, in traditional Friday morning to Funhouse fashion. So um, first thing so, Pete says every morning is, what are we going to call this, this show again? <laughs> <laughs> I make the mistake sometimes because sometimes we we figure this out ahead of time. And then if I don't write it out in my little notebook here, by the time we get to the morning of the taping, I'm like, what the fuck were we calling this show again? I'm like, Martin, do you remember? And he's like, well, we kind of said this and kind of said that. And so either we pick something completely new or our old man brains finally figure out and remember what we talked about a week before. So, yeah, we're nothing if not predictable. Right, Martin? Absolutely. <laughs> So thanks for watching, everybody. Visit us on the web at www.catranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on YouTube all together all the damn time. Please subscribe if you haven't already and click on that notification bell so you get alert of all of our content as it posts. And please do hit the like button before you leave. And please go give some love to uh, over at martinpopoff.com and check out some of these cool books and uh, get one for yourself or a loved one. That new Who book looks amazing. And of course, the uh, Blue Oyster Cult has got some interesting words from some Sea of Tranquility uh, folks here as well. So that uh, makes it all the more special. So uh, thanks for watching, everybody. See you next Friday here with another fun episode at the Fun House for Martin Popo, I am Pete Pardo. Stay tuned for the UK connection tomorrow. The professor's picks later this afternoon and ranking the albums of Church of Misery with myself and Karen LaPrezios on Sunday. So till then, have a good one, everybody. Bye bye. <laughs>